It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Sarah Feldner, NIOSH's Associate Director for Research Integration. Thank you, Nicole. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Thank you and welcome everyone to today's webinar. It is my pleasure to introduce our great panel of presenters today. We're gonna to do the introductions up front so we can move quickly between uh, presentations. Um, our first speaker today will be Gary Childress from Oil Stage Energy Services. Gary has 43 years of combined operations and quality, health, safety, and environment management experience in the oil and gas industry, serving in global roles supporting both manufacturing and field service operations. Gary presently serves as the Global Vice President of Quality, Health, Safety, Environmental, and Employee Development for Oil States Energy Services based in Houston, Texas. He also conceived Deuce, the award-winning industry movie, Left Undone, supporting H2S safety worldwide. Our second speaker today will be Barbara Dawson from DuPont. Barbara is an EHS fellow and global occupational hygiene competency leader at DuPont. She has over 40 years of experience in occupational health and safety and is a past president of the American Industrial Hygiene Association and past chair of the American Board of Industrial Hygiene. Prior to her current assignment, Barbara was the Safety, Health, and Environmental Resource Leader for DuPont Chemical Solutions Enterprise, the chemical business of DuPont. Barbara spent her first 10 years at DuPont as the Industrial Hygiene Programs Manager at the DuPont Chambers Worksite and Laboratory Director of an AIHA-accredited lab. Prior to DuPont, Barbara worked as an industrial hygienist for SmithKline Corporation and Ron Haas Company. Barbara has received the American Industrial Hygiene Association Distinguished Service Award and was recognized as a Salem County, New Jersey Woman of Achievement and was awarded the 2020 American Chemistry Council Member Company Employee of the Year. Our third speaker will be Brian Fieldco, representing Jetco Delivery and the GTI Group. Brian is a senior executive, author, and keynote speaker who is passionate about building high performing business cultures with a special focus on employee engagement and safety culture. Brian approaches business with the philosophy of strong on the inside, unbeatable on the outside. He currently serves as CEO of Houston-based Jetco Delivery and Executive Vice President of Montreal-based the GTI Group. The GTI Group offers open deck, heavy haul, intermodal, dedicated van, and freight brokerage services. Brian is author of dozens of articles and two books, including Leading People Safely, How to Win on, on the Business Battlefield. Brian recently launched Making Safety Happen, an online course and workshop designed to help organizations of all sizes grow their safety cultures. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Brian spoke extensively on how to lead people through crisis. He's also worked with NIOSH on their development our development of safety best practices for long haul professional truck drivers. He's especially proud of receiving the National Safety Council's Distinguished Service to Safety Award for his work in the field of applied safety. And our last speaker today will be Paul Riley from the Agriculture Safety and Health Council of America. Paul is a certified safety professional with 30 years of experience in occupational safety and health. He's worked in the safety and health profession in several different industries, including mining, agriculture, insurance, government, and construction. Paul is currently the Director of Safety and Health for AgReserves, Inc., a multinational agriculture company involved in a number of different commodities, including beef, dairy, nuts, fruit, vegetables, and grain. Paul sits on the Board of Directors of the Agriculture Safety and Health Council of America and has served as President of the Utah Chapter of the American Society of Safety Professionals. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Gary Childress, to our virtual podium. Gary? We can see your slides, Gary. Good morning, Sarah. Thank you uh, very much for the introduction and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with this group this morning. And thank you to NIOSH for uh, for uh, setting this up and establishing it. Uh, NIOSH has been extremely helpful during this time. It's been a great resource for us, our industry, 
uh, and for our work groups working through the pandemic. So I wanna thank you for that opportunity. I'm gonna be speaking today briefly about the uh, oil and gas industry, the service sector on the upstream side and kind of the effects. Uh, we work in a wide array of environments, both uh, onshore and offshore, which creates some unique opportunities uh, especially with, for safety as it relates to uh, COVID, the pandemic, and the things that we had to address. We also have unique environments that we have with far extremes from extremely cold, which can cause us all types of uh, issues and to himself to uh, some extremely uh, hot conditions, which uh, you know we experienced some real problems with COVID and trying to protect our people in these conditions throughout this last year. Um, we, we started out in the oil and gas industry with a downturn uh, in February. There was an industry downturn that began to occur, uh, reductions in workforce, um, and then a slowdown uh, that was COVID-related. So it was a double bang for our industry, causing us a lot of challenges, uh, staffing, financial, um, all these sort of things, and then being named essential workers and the need to really keep the flow of uh, oil and gas uh, to to, to uh, to the world. Um, we have uh, challenges like work travel, global rotations, local transportation, whether it be going to a local job site in a vehicle, uh, working at work camps, uh, travel lodging, and even workplace standby uh, was a real challenge for us. It seemed like anything we tried to do was a, was a real issue that would be kind of normal operations for us. We wouldn't think much of it and weren't really challenges. Um, another issue came up for us was a worker isolation from family and friends. Uh, because of all the requirements for isolation and for quarantine that we had to do in order to meet the requirements of whether it be countries and our customers. We had extensive or limited customer and country requirements. We had some customers who had very limited requirements, and then we had others who had quite extensive requirements, and we'd have employees going from to different sites, and then the contractors or service companies are intertwined uh, at these locations. So you might be dealing, uh, you might be uh, less than six feet away from an employee from a, a another service company who doesn't have the same type of requirements or as a timing hasn't gotten up to speed yet on what those requirements should be. Uh, so it did cause a lot of complicated things. The other thing is some of the PPE requirements. Uh, some of y'all may not be aware, but in the oil and gas industry, anything external has to be finely retardant. So one of the challenges we faced during the, the heat of the summer was flame retardant uh, face covering requirements in the workplace. Uh, it wasn't just the heat, but it was also uh, the, the effect on the skin, a lot of unknowns about wearing that material directly on your skin. Normally FR material is, uh, has an in interior lining and with the face mask, we had to put double linings to protect the skin. So those were real challenges. So we got approached about, we had to have a plan. Let's get this together. Let's continue to work. We're essential workers, you know, fast is, fa uh, fast is fine, but accuracy is final. Uh, and in the health and safety arena, we have to be very careful about the things we roll out. And many times we were be a little more conservative possibly uh, just until we knew we were all trying to search and figure out what the things we would do this, this uh, during that year. Um, we, we've managed local outbreaks before, um, especially like in Asia Pacific. We've all been in, involved in our industry where there were issues that were happening, but ne never a global pandemic. Um, we needed a plan in our industry that was both uh, for a mobile workforce and an integrated workforce within the industry because of sign ops. Uh, again, work sites, living quarters, uh, and, and transport. Uh, globally and locally. That could be traveling to the Middle East. It could be as simple as getting into a pickup with a crew and going a few miles down the road. They were all challenges. Um, we had a hazard that you couldn't see or detect. Uh, there were a lot of unknowns that were out there. And I say it's complicated. Uh, we have a workforce that uh, possibly in some cases may have challenged exactly what was going on why it was going on, um, what was the degree of the hazard that was really there. And we had to work through a lot of those things with our employees and we had to do that very quickly and aggressively. We didn't need a company plan, we needed an industry plan. So um, we were very fortunate to, and part of an industry group working close with NIOSH, which helped a lot. We also uh, worked with um, 
uh, with Energy Workforce and Technology Council, which is an industry work group within the oil and gas sector for service companies. We are having weekly meetings. How are you handling this? What's going on? What's the latest development? How's that worked for you? What are the unique things? Sharing of best practices. It helped us immensely uh, to be able to do that. And then we joined uh, arms with the HR group and had a HR, uh, HSC, a QHSC uh, town halls that were coming up across the industry for all member companies. So working together on that, I think it really helped us an awful lot to be able to streamline our industry and to also be able to find solutions that were common, share best practices and work together. So again, uh, NIOSH was very helpful on that and even provided uh, some of the webinars and seminars that our member companies within that group were able to attend. We found some unique solutions that were out there in the past that we was that maybe uh, weren't as well accepted today uh, because of this is, is really helping us a lot. Uh, my particular company came up with a solution called CERT Live where we're doing real-time employee acknowledgement, uh, training online, uh, video uh, facial recognition, micro learnings, more segmented, smaller sessions to support the times between us being together. And then training with the legacy employees, staying in contact with them. I think that was the biggest thing for us was staying in contact with everyone and making sure that everyone is involved. Having access to information, these are things that a lot of our organizations had in place today uh, before the pandemic, but I think it really helped to solidify the use of technology. Um, in our organization, we have over uh, 2,061 electronic interactive real-time access documents online and offline. Everything from procedures and practices on the HSC side, quality, standard operating procedures, forms that need to be completed, alerts that go out, customer communications, over 800 safety data sheets uh, that they have to have access to, along with their chemical inventory lists associated with their site of operations. Pretty complex, a lot of information. We're able to see who's participating and who's engaged. This helped us immensely during this process because I think in the past, we didn't really think about that. And we didn't wanna lose any employees during this time. We wanted to make sure that they were all engaged and they were participating and this tool really helped us a lot. Equipment inspection, we had to make sure that that didn't suffer. Uh, we have over 5,700 items that are all QR code within our system. We were able to see real time, how was that working? Were there any problems or issues associated with that? And we're able to really drill into where were the gaps in our systems out there because we did. We had situations occur where it seemed like, especially with a lot of the more administrative types were working remote we had site people that were still required to be on site and we had to keep those two groups engaged and working together uh, and that was a solution that really seemed to help us out a lot um, some of the challenges uh, post pandemic future and lessons learned wanted to talk about the things that we experienced but now i want to talk about the things that we're looking forward to some of the things the takeaways from this period um, safety for remote workers i've seen several studies that talk about plus or minus 40% of the administrative type workforce is gonna be working from home, if, if not full-time, part of that time. As a long-time health and safe, safety professional, I'm wondering how will we manage that? What does that look like? Uh, what is an incident? What, what is an injury? How, how will we manage somebody, uh, support someone in their own well, workplace, in their home? It's a question that uh, with a shift in the workforce and where it's at, I think it's something we haven't uh, figured out how we're going to address, but we know it's out there. Uh, rethinking business travel and customer interactions. Um, we would, at the drop of a hat, go and, and get on a plane or, and, or travel uh, to a location or go to see, an, uh, see a customer. Uh, I, I think we're really rethinking that. What is really necessary? Because of a lot of, we did have a lot of success this year as an industry and as an organization of running our business this way. Uh, a lot of ingenuity and a lot of great ideas came into it, uh, a lot of getting together and solving these problems on, a, on almost like a running gunfight as it was happening and as the rules or the requirements were evolving at the same time. Uh, revisiting employee engagement and development. I think this is, this is going to give us a real opportunity to really think through how do we do that? What can be the most effective? Staying engaged more frequently face-to-face uh, -face is important, but what could we do where employees are engaged more often? And can we use this technology now that seems to be much more accepted and ingrained and, and definitely evolving uh, all the way around? Uh, another is the flexibility divide between remote and site workers. Um, you know, it's going to be important, I think, uh, that, we, that we look at that, that we, that we keep that out in front of ourselves. 
we don't want to have the, a, a problem where the people that are required to be at work versus those that really do not need to be in a workplace uh, become some type of a, a barrier between them. We got to think through how are we going to manage that environment because more and more of our organizations across our industry are having uh, quite a number of remote workers who have a lot of flexibility and others that don't have the same flexibility. Um, another one that concerned me all the way through this process, and it didn't necessarily go out the window, but I felt like it was uh, it was uh, challenged a little bit, and that's uh, employee health confidentiality. Uh, challenges. Uh, when someone comes up uh, positive and has to be isolated, uh, quarantined, whatever the case may be, um, it, it really starts to uh, be a problem of the on the confidentiality side. We had workers that were isolated. If you were going into offshore on a platform, you had to be isolated uh, for a period of time at a hotel and tested periodically, and then you could be transported uh, to uh, by helicopter or by crew boat once you had served your uh, 10 days or whatever the requirement may be to be isolated. We had others that when they arrived in country in the Middle East, they had to be isolated in country. They had to be tested four times um, before they, and the fourth time being at the job site. And so, and then all the hitches were extended. They went from a 15 day hitch to 35 day hitches. So everyone knew when someone came up positive, whether it was, it was pretty clear and evident when that happened because of replacements and things of this nature. So how we manage that going forward, uh, making sure there's not a stigma associated with that in the beginning, there seemed to be some of that. And I think that's a real challenge that we, that we need to work on as management team, as professionals. Um, one of the positives, uh, remote worker uh, reduced transit. Uh, I think this improves our ESG efforts on our sustainability side, our scope uh, three greenhouse gas emissions, because in scope three, we have to calculate in our employee emissions. So as an industry and as industry as a whole, um, I think that's going to help some of our numbers. That's it, while it's a drop in the bucket. Um, it's quite substantial here in Houston, where I'm based, where you know, most employees are driving each way 45 minutes to an hour to work each day. Uh, if we can reduce that by 40 to 50 percent, that's a that's a significant contribution to our efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. I said it earlier, improving technology, acceptance and trust. How can we capitalize on that? Uh, really capitalize on that, but not overdo it. Go back to a go to a good mix of connectivity with our employees. Uh, the greatest concern I have overall is the next pandemic, the next wave, the next variant. Uh, they're talking about. Um, um, India right now, and they said this morning on the news that the same variant has, has showed up in the UK. Uh, I don't know how it is in most parts of the country, but I think we'll have a pretty hard time here in Texas to get people to go back to if we have to revert back to where we were, say, mid-2020. I think it's going to be a lot more challenging for us as professionals. I think it's something that we have to think about how we're going to work with our workforce uh, to make sure that we're doing the things that we need to do to protect them and uh, accept those challenges. So I think that's probably one of our greatest challenges going forward. Um, again, uh, that's the information that I have that I wanted to share today. Thanks again to NIOSH for this opportunity. And I look forward to the questions at the end. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, and while you are unsharing your screen, um, I wanna thank you for that interesting look into the unique challenges and key learnings from the pandemic for the oil and gas industry. Um, and now I'd like to invite our next speaker, Barbara Dawson, to our virtual podium. Barbara? We can see your screen. Your slide. Yep, sorry. Okay, thank you. And um, I think a lot of what, what you'll hear me say will be very similar to what Gary said in some respects. Um, but first, before... Um, we, we get going, I thought maybe I would talk a little bit about the history of DuPont and, and the DuPont of today. Um, some of the things we did during the, the actual um, height of the pandemic and then what we're seeing now as challenges in, in our post-pandemic world and, and how we're addressing them. So um, I think one thing that, that I'd like to emphasize is that DuPont has a very strong safety culture um, the, the company was initially founded in 18 to, 1802 as a powder mill um, in Wilmington, Delaware. And very early on, there were rules around operation of the facility and um, a mission to understand the hazards that were there. Um, you know, one of the, the rules that I was most impressed by was 
no employee may enter a new or rebuilt um, mill until a member of top management has personally operated it. We didn't um, even back then want to put employees at risk that we weren't putting um, ourselves at risk for. And so we'd like to say safety is in our DNA. Um, even back then, there were some process safety kind of um, practices put into place. They spaced buildings out so that they were, um, if one building had an incident, it wouldn't impact the surrounding buildings. And the, the walls had, a, or the buildings had a blowout wall that went over the river um, so that it didn't, have any impact on the surrounding area as well. And you know, one other aspect that goes back to what I, I stated on the first page, um, EI DuPont actually built his house on the, the property so that he and his family would be exposed to the same risks as his workers. Um, DuPont has core values that really inform everything that we do. <clears throat> the core values are listed there, safety and health first and foremost but respect for people and protecting the planet and highest ethical behavior. Well, slide's not advancing for some reason. Okay, sorry. Um, so we did have a, a new company formed in 2019. Some of you may have seen, you know, in the news that DuPont and Dow merged and then we split into um, three separate companies, but the, the businesses that remain with um, the new DuPont are, are shown here. Some of the products that might be familiar to you are, are Kevlar and Nomex and Tyvek. Um, but we, we have a little over 23,000 employees now, but we operate in 40 different countries. So um, we did have an effort underway to manage the pandemic globally. Um, we, Almost immediately permitted only essential workers on the site. Everyone else was sent home to work. Um, we did keep our plants running. Um, we did temperature screening and had face coverings required and you know, physical distancing requirements and stopped all food service at the sites. I think pretty much similar to what every um, industrial employer was doing at that time. Um, face coverings, you know, you. Um, so on the previous slide, we do have Nomex as one of our businesses. So we quickly worked with our, our DuPont Protective Apparel Group to uh, produce Nomex face covering so that we were able to have um, Nomex face coverings in the area where we required flame retardant clothing. Um, we stopped all business travel and that's really just starting to, to start back up. Um, but we had a, a lot of meetings, we, we had a global pandemic team activated and we prepared site guidance about making the workplace safe for essential workers, but also, you know, even at the very beginning started planning for the eventual return of, of the other workers to the work site. Um, we, we put together a team of engineers and industrial hygienists and prepared um, site guidance and conducted webinars on how to assess and upgrade the building ventilation as appropriate. Um, similar to what we saw on the last presentation, we, we had developed an app that, that workers could check in with um, on a daily basis. Um, and it didn't contain direct medical information. We didn't save anything from it, but it did alert a supervisor whether that person was going to be able to come to work that day. Um, and the, you know, the, this one I completed and it showed, you know, I was safe to continue, but if someone did get a red circle, they were directed to go to medical um, to get any questions answered. Um, frequent employee communication, again, similar to what Gary said, was really important. Um, we, we had lots of emails, video messages, signs posted, et cetera, um, and, and trying to keep employees engaged was a challenge. Um, before we brought anyone back, we, we had computer-based training modules that covered the requirements for accessing the sites and, and people were required to take those. Um, we did develop a SharePoint site that was globally accessible to all employees where we centralized information, um, including frequently asked questions. Um, and that was, you know, a, we, we had a lot of hits on that. So we know people were utilizing it. 
Um, and then we also developed one pager core value messages that um, we issued almost on a weekly basis. They were posted um, on the SharePoint site for use as toolbox meeting starters or virtual meeting starters. And the next slide is an example of one of the early ones that we had put together. Again, trying to make sure that people had access to information, um, things that they should be doing to protect themselves and protect the others in the workplace, their coworkers, and also, you know, to protect their families. And then also, you know, talked about what we were doing to protect them as well. So what did we learn? Um, we were able to keep most of the production going without interruption. Um, that was due to the diligence of our, our workforce and the essential workers. Um, sometimes we would get a positive case in a worker and that presented a challenge to us to have enough people to keep the operations going because we would require the, the coworkers to quarantine who had been in close contact. Um, our medical group really went into high gear and you know continues to work in high gear doing our, our contact tracing and just keeping track of all of the information that, that we needed to keep track of from a medical standpoint. Um, we found that a lot of people didn't use their vacation days. Um, you know, that's been an issue for, for a lot of years that not all the vacation days were being used, but it was um, significant last year. And um, we, we heard a lot of feedback that they were working harder than they had worked in the office, you know, longer days, um, more, um, you know, less distraction. Um, we also found that the employees who were single parents and, and those um, with two working spouses and, and young children seem to be struggling the most. And, um, you know, we've tried to put um, support systems in place for those. Um, but we also found that some people thrived on working from home and they don't want to go back to the office. So, um, you know, what did we do through all of this? I mentioned we upgraded ventilation rates and filter efficiencies on our ventilation systems as needed. Um, we, we got signs posted immediately with maximum capacities to make sure that we could maintain proper physical distancing and put enhanced cleaning and disinfecting um, procedures in place. And if we did have somebody test positive, we, we would have um, a crew come in and do deep cleaning. From a remote work standpoint, um, we, we did a lot of virtual ergonomic assessments and made recommendations for improved workstations. Um, we allowed our office workers to take their monitors and keyboards and headsets home. And we, we made arrangements to deliver office chairs so that no one got hurt, um, you know, transporting their own chair. And we also did a lot of upgrade to our cybersecurity and IT capabilities. Um, you know, we, we continue to try to address some of the work-life balance issues that have arisen. You know, I think we've worked to, toward a new paradigm that, you know, work is no longer a place to be at a specific time but a set of tasks and activities that need to be done. And we've really allowed employees to flex their work schedules to meet personal needs, you know, such as childcare, picking up children, dropping off children at school and so on. Um, we've also done even more um, mental health counseling and well-being options. Um, we've expanded access to them and um, I think that we've gotten positive feedback from workers that that has been helpful as well. Financial concerns, we did pay people when they were quarantined because of an occupational close contact. So I think that helped alleviate some of the um, concerns that people had to, when we asked them to go into quarantine. Some of the, you know, continuing challenges that we're, we're addressing, um, you know, we do have a non-traditional workforce now. There's a lot of people working from home. Um, we have, over the years, increased our contingent and part-time workers. So making sure that they also have access to the um, support systems that we have for our DuPont employees is important. Um, we're starting to recognize that more people will be permanently doing remote work. And so as, as Gary mentioned, making sure that the working conditions and safe are safe and healthy for those who aren't working at a DuPont site. 
Um, and again, continued access to mental health and well-being counseling. And we're, we're providing a lot of tools and guidance and tips from HR um, about you know, setting limits for self-care and establishing strategies to avoid working too many hours. Um, one thing that we're still in the process of doing, and that's upgrading our conference rooms to improve um, the capability for hybrid meetings. You know, we, we had some conference rooms that had video camera capability, but um, they were older setups and didn't allow focusing on a particular individual or showing everyone in the room. So we've made some um, accommodations so that we can have better hybrid meetings and, and let people feel more engaged and connected during meetings. Um, some of the challenges that, that we're still sort of struggling with and trying to address is how to maintain the company culture when everybody's not all there together. Um, it's especially a challenge, I think, with newer employees um, who, who haven't, um, you know, had a long time working under our company culture. Um, you know, collaboration continues to be a challenge, you know, how to, to help people feel connected and engaged. Um, we use Microsoft Teams. We've created a lot of team um, workspaces with different channels so people can um, communicate more easily. And, you know, we, we have, I spend probably eight hours a day on, on Teams calls. Um, so, you know, we do try very hard to keep people connected um, probably it's a bit easier for our employees to stay connected, but we're also looking at our business partners, you know, such as contractors or, or contract manufacturers and also customers and, and working hard to make sure that we're maintaining um, close relationships with each of them. Um, you know, another challenge is how to develop the collaboration and leadership skills in the people working remotely. So, you know, sharing um, some of the responsibilities for um, meeting facilitation or meeting leaders has been helpful. Um, you know, even though they're working re remotely, they, they have responsibilities and we're trying to encourage development of those skills. And again, just providing regular feedback, you know, making sure that managers are communicating more frequently with, with their employees who are working remotely so that um, they do stay engaged. And, you know, we are I mentioned providing some tools to facilitate inclusion in that respect. Um, we're also supporting working parents with child care needs. And I, I talked about the flexible scheduling and, you know, we're continuing to try to make sure that, that um, you know, work isn't creating it an unnecessary stressor with their, their work-life balance. Um, we've done some hiring of new employees by virtual interviews and, you know, they're starting out as remote workers until we bring people back into the sites. So, you know, that has presented a bit of a challenge to make them feel welcome and a part of the company as well. So, you know, one of the, the things that I liked as I, I've been doing research over the last year is um, the statement in, in the Microsoft um, World Trend Index. You know, if we do embrace flexibility and, you know, learn from what the data are telling us and listen to our employees, I think we're going to create a better future um, for all of our workers. So thank you. And I have my contact information here if anyone wants to follow up after the fact. Barbara, thank you very much for that interesting look at the early and long history of health and safety at DuPont. And also for your insight into uh, future industrial worker health and safety challenges. Our next speaker is going to be Brian Filco from Jetco and the GTI group. Brian? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Nicole. And I'd like to thank uh, NIOSH for making this great conversation available. Um, <clears throat> so today I want to talk a little bit about what the lessons learned and in terms of leading people safely uh, in, in what, what did we learn over the past year and what are we gonna take with us as we um, uh, lead our teams uh, safely in, in the post COVID era, which hopefully is either here or, or upon us shortly. Um, but first, just a word about trucking in general. Um, you know, one of the things that got us through and, and prepared us 
for this uh, sort of un, you know, un unplanned uh, glo global catastrophe is just generally our ability to handle crises in the past. So we learned from our own experience on best practices. Being in Houston, you know, uh, hurricanes and, and weather, certainly, I guess now freezing weather, um, are fairly common. So we, we took our knowledge on, on how to handle um, past events and, and brought those forward. And that, that was a big help. You've always got to draw on your experience and sort of draw analogies to the, the situation today. And before we get into talking about post-COVID, I want to remind everybody sort of what the trucking industry went through, uh, especially back in March, April, uh, May of, of uh, 2020 at the onset. Here's a clip from um, the Today Show. If you just give me a minute, it'll start playing. You should be able to get your audio. If you can't hear it, let me know. This morning, truckers nationwide <laughs> collectively revving up the heart of America's economic engine. Do you feel like you're a lifeline for people? Of course. You know, without a truck, you know, America will stop. Millions pumping hand sanitizer for safety. We do this all day, every day. And then pumping out food, medicine, and clothing to anxious consumers who are buying household goods like they'll never see them again. On behalf of American truckers, slow down, people. Just get enough for a few days for your family. Another truck is coming. We're coming. The truckers are coming, people. And Food for the soul to an often unheralded workforce that's keeping our nation moving. What do you want people to know about people in the trucking industry who are risking everything right now to be able to get the goods delivered? I just want to say, you know, the, we got your backs. So our industry, uh, you know, not, not just uh, our company, but our industry operated through some difficult times, right? Uh, when restaurants were closed, um, you can't really get a truck up to a drive through So there were basic challenges back then, uh, food, uh, just basic essentials as, as things shut down. But yet our industry, be, because essential workers, you know, we couldn't shut down. And, and the industry moved and then was a big part uh, of vaccine logistics. And that was fascinating to watch. Uh, how the trucking industry mobilized as part of the uh, distribution effort. So, you know, the industry is resilient and, 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 and flexible, but there are some core lessons that we learned that just aren't related to trucking. I think it relates to leading people safely. So, you know, it's been a bit like herding cats. Um, and a lot of what we've had to deal with as business people is, uh, perceptions in the news and mixed messages and different people brought to the office different perceptions about the pandemic uh and and our job was to lead our team often in the absence of a clear you know federal government leadership uh, or at least conflicting you know uh, advice the thing that struck me the most and that i'll take away from the pandemic more than anything is how differently people perceive risk, right? Um, one person can look at an icy sidewalk and say, well, there's an opportunity to go skating. And another person looks at the icy sidewalk and sees a, a, a hazard. And I guess I never was as focused on just how differently people perceive risk. And that creates, I think, going forward, a, a certain level of wisdom in how we manage people in an organization when individual personal risk perceptions clearly very wildly. Going back to the idea of using what we know, right? In, in my mind, safety and behavior are one and the same. So when I'm talking to our team and when I'm talking to outsiders, I, I, I use this, 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 what's called the accident pyramid. It says 30,000 unsafe conditions, um, uh, decisions. In other words, 30,000 unsafe behaviors yields 3,000 accidents resulting in you know, minor or no injury, 300 involving lost time, 30 disablements, and one fatality. So it's really your choice. Um, do you want to be good at cleaning up the mess, or do you want to focus on prevention? And prevention is about behavior. It's about the unsafe conditions and decisions. So we built we took our what we know, right? We took our experience, and so we built 
you know, a COVID pyramid. And we didn't focus, so many people uh, uh, would focus on the death count, right? That's sort of like focusing on the fatality account in terms of in, in industrial safety. You don't want to focus on that. You want to focus on prevention. And whether somebody tested positive and was asymptomatic or just got a little sick and got better or they have long-term complications or somebody passed away, that's to me all sort of a function that, that that's harder to control, right? If you can control prevention, so hygiene, face covering, social distancing, discipline, we're doing it this way. If you wanna work at my company, these are the things that we focused on, respect, consideration for those around you. So we had to sort of check in our preconceived notions at the door, but we followed CDC guidance. Um, and, and because of that, you know, we had thus far, we've had zero people contact traced uh, back to our company and you know when we have had positives we've shut things down we've, we've we've cleaned so you know in the absence of clear direction you know each business i think has had to make its own decisions and we've just used what we know about safety and behavior and applied the same to an a very uncertain fluid situation um and we've had to have con candid conversations with employees you know the only thing more dangerous that ignorance is arrogance. That's that's Albert Einstein's quote, and and it's important because it seems to me that you know everybody would Google an, uh, an article and become an epidemiologist, and we were very clear that in all aspects of our business we respect experts, we bring experts in, we listen to experts, and you know what? They don't bat a thousand, especially in a rapidly evolving situation. So we changed with the times, and we continue to change, but we sort of drove. Um, the, the, the popular social media pandemic language out of our company because it didn't add any value. Um, and part of safety leadership in the midst of such a crisis is you've got to be prepared to execute um, without all the facts. Uh, if you wait for all the facts, I think it's too late. So I, I have always liked this quote that says a good plan violently executed right now is far better than a perfect plan executed next week. In other words, you, you had to act, you had to make decisions. No different than when the hurricane uh, is at your doorstep. Uh, is the hurricane gonna be a direct hit? Is it gonna be flooding? Is it gonna, be, is it gonna take your, your business out? Or is it gonna be nothing? You don't know that, right? So you've gotta start executing in the face of uncertainty. And I think we did that well all along. Uh, and and, and that, that certainly helped us. And we were never too proud of our plan to make course corrections because again, we were all learning in real time. Uh, there was no perfection. So some of the tangible lessons are, you know, I, I won't use the term safety anymore <laughs> without using the term health and safety. So I believe that our, our company and our culture have been very safety focused for a long time, but have we been as health focused? And I think I can honestly answer that by saying no, but we are now. So a, a big lesson for us has been to incorporate health, uh, whether it's, it's employee health or whether it's sort of more industrial hygiene, more aggressively into our business uh, th than we had in the past. So no longer is it safety, it's health and safety. Specifically, um, you know, we're not gonna let go of face coverings so fast. There's a time and place for them. Um, but more, let's go real boots on the ground. Like when a truck is in the shop for maintenance, um, uh, or if, if driver A leaves that truck and driver B comes into that truck, we probably cleaned it, but did we deep clean it? I don't think so. Now we do. So, you know, we're really focused on, on the cleanliness of the, not, not just the office, but the, um, equipment that our, professional employees operate around. So we're a lot more focused on, on equipment hygiene uh, and, and I think that's here to stay. So it's, it's a whole new way of thinking that I think COVID has taught us. Um, I know it was already mentioned uh, remote learning and, and, and how people have really risen to the occasion working from home. We've got to remember that our frontline employees generally don't have the ability to work from home. You know, you, you got to be behind the wheel. You got to be in the plant. So um, a lot of the in-person training that we've done was put on hold 
but you can't have a gap in training. So we really moved aggressively to weekly training videos and people loved them. So it's not like a you know half hour, 45 minutes, 10 minutes a week um, with, with, with a little quiz at the end. Um, in my mind, there's nothing that's gonna replace human contact. But I can also say that we can train people faster, more efficiently, more effectively by using technology and layering that in with the in-person training. So we're gonna be using technology more and more to train. Um, you know, the trucking industry in one aspect has been a little bit slow to respond. Uh, for a long time, we've had the ability to digitize the proof of delivery process, right? Less contact between uh, the driver and the folks in the warehouse on their shipping and receiving end. Um, our company has been pretty far ahead when it comes to deploying technology to make the driver experience better. But the actual transaction with the customer um, has generally been paper driven for a lot of companies. And I think you're seeing the whole industry move to digital. The pandemic forced it. That's a very, very good thing for, for everybody. So technology is really, we've been able to use it and it's played a big part. <clears throat> we've also refocused on our disaster recovery plans. We've had a business continuity plan in place um, for a long time, but you know, there wasn't a chapter on pandemics and, and sort of global disruptions, right? When we think about con business continuity, we might think about uh, weather or, you know, labor disruptions or, you know, any, any sort of natural disasters. But we've begun to think a lot more broadly um, when it comes to employee health and safety um, on a major business disruption, the likes of one, the likes of which, you know, we didn't really foresee um, uh, until COVID. So I think it's made us a lot smarter about redundancy, about backup plans. Uh, we didn't lose a day of production uh, throughout COVID. Um, as I said, we've had, we've had uh, positive tests that have caused certain areas to shut down, supplemented with remote work. Um, and you know, a lot of our professional drivers, people in the warehouse, shops, you know, mechanics, sort of are naturally distanced by, the, by virtue of their job. Um, but things stayed together. And I, and I definitely share Barbara's concern though that this works, but it will take a toll on your culture. Um, you know, our culture is our everything, uh, especially with new employees uh, who you need to assimilate and integrate into the culture. So we're, we're very focused on, on maintaining the culture, but at the same time, letting people uh, continue to work in a hybrid basis from the office and, and remotely where possible. But back on the continuity plan, I think a, a best practice coming out of COVID is to right now, not a year or two from now, what did we learn? Uh, is it documented? If something happens again, not necessarily a pandemic, right? It could be a multitude of things. Is it written down? Are we prepared? And if it happens, we need to, you know, our brains need to go off. We need to go into execution mode. So let's have that in case of emergency break glass. Two things on safety leadership. First of all, you know, the shadow that leaders cast is enormous. Uh, sometimes we don't appreciate the shadow that we cast. Um, and I think it was pretty important. It was, it was extremely important for us to show up with a plan, confident, but yet humble, confident, but yet vulnerable. No reason to show people, well, I'm not afraid. This is easy. Ah, this is just the flu, right? It's ridiculous. I mean, it's not just the flu. And we, um, I think, did a pretty good job uh, being, being transparent with our people, having a plan, as I said earlier, modifying the plan as needed. And then also we had to be flexible, right? We couldn't get too married uh, to one idea because things changed in real time. And a, a lesson that's so critical is when you're leading people safely, you've got to put humanity first, okay? As I said in an earlier slide, we all perceive risk differently. Um, but then we have different issues at home. Uh, uh, if our drivers, go over the road, there might be family members who didn't like that. Hey, I don't want you leaving town. Why? Because they're afraid, right? There's fear at home. And if you're not sensitive to the fact that you're managing not just the driver, but the driver's 
family and you're trying to balance the workload with real legitimate human concerns, I think you're missing, you, you sort of miss the, the opportunity because it, you have to put human beings first. These aren't robots showing up every day. And we did everything we could to accommodate employees that wanted to stay local, didn't want to go out of town. And then there were plenty of employees that were happy to, uh, to, to venture out, but it's not a one size fits all proposition. You got to put humanity first. And as we leave the COVID era, let's be real clear that we're not all coming out equally. Some people are ready to go. I'm so over this. Let, let's get let's get behind it. Other people, I really believe that I don't. I'm not using this term cavalierly, truly, but I really believe there's there's PTSD. I think that there are some people that are going to take a long time to get over this. And as employers, we have to have that patience um, and understanding that we're all going to come out of this differently. We're all going to come out, but it's not going to be at the same pace. And I don't think it's fair for us as leaders to expect that. <clears throat> um, going through crises, hurricanes, uh, and, and now COVID, there's a real foxhole mentality that develops, right? We got through this together. Um, there was no safety department, right? Safety is a way of life. Um, operations, safety, uh, frontline employees, C-suite, we're all in this together. We're all fighting an uh, 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 enemy that's too small for us to see. Um, we're dealing with all sorts of misinformation, but the goal is to come out of this better and smarter than we went in. And we've certainly reminded people of that as, as the cases of de are declining, that we're not letting up on our discipline, but that, you know, uh, we, we got through this together. Um, nobody got sick on our watch uh, because we put you and your families first, uh, because that's what really matters. And if we're strong on the inside, that's the only way that we can become unbeatable on the outside. And while not everybody will remember, I hope that a good number of our employees will remember what we did you know, to put their safety first. And they'll remember that uh, and hopefully you know, re re remain uh, on our team. I said before, safety is not a department. I think this was a huge opportunity for industrial safety professionals to redefine their role. Um, because during the COVID crisis, right, you had stakeholders, families, clients, um, you know, every, you know, we had clients with different standards, right? Some, uh, in terms of distancing, were very careful, some weren't. Um, sometimes we had to balance our standards with client standards, always erring on the side of our standards if ours were more rigid. Um, but safety really over the past year and a half was able to show the true resource that it is. And I remind safety professionals um, not to let go of that, not to let go of the late night conversations with the C-suite saying, what do we do now? You know, conversations that probably didn't happen in a normal time. So I think it's an opportunity too for safety professionals and safety teams to redefine themselves inside of their own organizations and with their clients, maybe in a way that wasn't available in sort of more normal times. And uh, one more Einstein quote for you, right? In the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. Um, and I wouldn't wish the, the COVID era on anybody, but it happened. And we played the hand that we're dealt. Um, and hopefully some of the learnings I shared with you resonate and uh, will help every one of us on this call define and capture those opportunities that you know invariably come out of uh, difficult times. So here's my contact information. Um, I'll put my LinkedIn uh, address in the chat box in just a minute, but feel free to give me a call, email me, connect on LinkedIn. Um, I love the conversation. I've loved hearing the other presentations and uh, 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 really appreciate the invitation to be part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, for that great discussion of approaches to leveraging the pandemic response and to leading people safely in the post-pandemic era. Our final speaker today is Paul Riley from the Agriculture Safety and Health Council of America. Paul, welcome to our virtual podium. It's great to hear or to be here, and I'm hoping everybody can see we my can presentation. See your slides and hear you well. Great. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, NIOSH 
and ASHCA, the Agricultural Safety and Health Council of America, for this opportunity. Uh, we in the agriculture industry recognize that uh, NIOSH has done and continues to do uh, research and projects to help with and improve the safety and health of, of agriculture workers. So, so thank you very much. Um, COVID did impact the agricultural industry um, quite a bit. <clears throat> and uh, so I'd like to just share a little bit about how it did impact us and, and kind of what the future looks like um, with regards to that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I know I was listed as working with ASHCA and I am on their board of directors, but I, but I do work for the company called Ag Reserves Inc. And um, we provide food and that's what, that's the critical thing. We, we have critical workers. They, we, we had to keep food on the table and to keep that food coming. We had to keep it growing uh, and, and we had to go through harvests as well with, uh, with COVID-19 uh, going on. So we did, you know, one of the things we learned as a company is it did help us to, um, you know, we, we always knew that if there was a need in the world that we could donate uh, a lot of food and provide food because we have beef, we have potatoes, we have, uh, we, we have onions, we have nuts, so proteins and those things and, and milk and cheese. And so one of the things that COVID allowed for us to do is some of the restaurants started shutting down and some of the demand for some of our commodities uh, were slow. Uh, we had extra and so we were able to take and donate a lot of that food whether it was a truckload of potatoes to a community or uh, or milk and cheese to a community it was just a great opportunity for our company as an agriculture company to see uh, how we could quickly change from uh, sending our product to um, to some of our processing facilities versus uh, providing it to those that might be in more need um, so uh, to start off, shortly after COVID started, um, as the safety and health director of this large agriculture company, we quickly recognized that we did not have a pandemic policy in place. And in fact, a lot of policy samples we were seeing out there were, uh, you know, COVID specific. And we were saying, well, this COVID is just one of many future potential uh, pandemics. So we decided to create a pandemic policy, which included, I thought it was so important that we have a committee made up of uh, some of the C-suite, as well as the vice president of HR and, um, and the directors. Um, and so we would meet regularly, coming up with policy, uh, creating the policy. I, I was assigned to lead that project, uh, discussing how we're going to disinfect workspaces, discussing hygiene of employees, how they're going to physical distance in a processing plant, uh, the PPE shortage issues, the postings that needed to go out, <clears throat> the issue with seasonal employees who didn't have sick leave, who sometimes live paycheck to paycheck, and we needed to, how can we encourage them to, to stay home if they're sick? And so we quickly came up with an additional 80 hours of pandemic sick leave to allow an employee to stay home from work and pay them. Uh, that was so critical for us to be able to do that to, for the safety and health of all of our workers. Um, telecommuting uh, for mostly white collar uh, you know, employees in the business, and then how would returning to work look for those employees? The policy, the pandemic policy had to address how we safely onboard employees uh, and provide training to them. We looked into the pre-screening. We looked even into temperature checks. We chose not to do temperature checks like some industries have, uh, but we did, um, we did have them on their honor fill out a daily paperwork saying that they, they, they don't have a temperature. Um, we, when we get positive tests, we asked our employees, we kind of tied the pandemic sick leave so that we, to, to informing us about um, positive tests so that we could track COVID. We thought it was important to uh, uh, staying on top of our workers. And we actually had a system in place. It was an automated dashboard that would show our leadership, how many employees tested positive for, for COVID-19. We tracked that. Uh, it was important to do investigations, as you'll see here in just a minute. I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and uh, we just wanted to ensure that our employees that tested positive were staying home, keeping others safe, them getting better. Unfortunately, uh, when you look at our whole operation globally, we did lose seven employees uh, earlier than, than we should have lost them to COVID-19. 
So <clears throat> with regards to investigating and, and, and finding out about positive COVID cases in the workplace, there was a new thing with regards to the impact on OSHA record keeping. As many of you know, some companies, uh, as you've seen in some previous presentations, that some of us measure lagging and leading indicators in safety and health to see how we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, it was starting to become clear that we're potentially going to have employees who contract COVID-19 in the workplace. And is that an OSHA recordable? Very quickly, OSHA jumped, jumped in, as well as our workers' compensation carriers, uh, to tell us that this is something we needed to investigate. So one of our first eye-openers was uh, in Utah in September at our dairy where we had a COVID-19 outbreak in the workplace, where we had six employees that were affected, uh, a group of milkers, as well as a group of maintenance employees. This was even after all of our training, because we started meeting and creating our pandemic policy in April and, and May and trying to get on top of that and answer the questions that were coming in from the field. Um, and so we were training and we were encouraging and face coverings were required. And But it just happened to be that you know, again, we're all over the world and everybody has a different culture, a different mentality. And um, even though we might educate them, some of them may not agree with what's going on. And so we actually had some employees that were a little bit more casual with their thinking and chose not to wear face coverings while they shared a company vehicle or equipment uh, or working closely together in a milk parlor. And because of that, um, casual face coverings and, and lack of physical distancing, it, it affected our employees. It even affected some of our employee housing um, and we quickly found out that if that we needed to investigate these thoroughly to determine if potentially they could be eligible for workers' compensation benefits. There were some laws that passed in California where most of our nut operations happen, uh, where we had to, if there was a COVID related, um, if there was an employee who tested positive for COVID and they don't know how they got it and they were working, then California had a law saying, well, then we need to presume it happened in the workplace. And therefore, you're going to report it to your workers comp carrier or your TPA, your third party administrator. And so and then OSHA quickly came out saying, well, uh, even though, yes, we say that, uh, you know, the common cold and the flu is not a, a reportable or recordable injury, uh, COVID-19 will be if, if you determine that it was uh, contracted in the workplace. Um, if there was workplace relatedness then you needed to investigate. And so we investigated, we even had to create our own little uh, separate investigation questionnaire we would have an employee fill out so that we can try to find out how this person got exposed. Not only, it was not only to determine if it was recordable, but also what, what are we doing wrong? What can we do to help better protect our employees in the workplace? Also very quickly, Co uh, OSHA came out with the COVID, pre COVID prevention program Cal OSHA required it, uh, you know, it was recommended, highly recommended for the rest of the nation. Uh, there were 15 different things that they talked about saying, hey, you should have a written program. We basically went through our pandemic policy is what we did. And we, as we went through our pandemic policy, we tried to see, did we meet everything that OSHA or Cal OSHA was requiring? Um, and so we didn't create a special COVID and we made sure with Cal OSHA that it was okay that it didn't say COVID uh, prevention program. It was okay that it could say a pandemic policy. They were fine as long as it had all of the main elements that they were looking for. So if many of you aren't aware of that, this is what OSHA was either uh, guiding us and recommending or they were mandating. So after going through that, you're getting to the end and we're thinking, oh goodness, great vaccines are coming into play. This is going to be good. Uh, but there was a lot of things that came about with regards to vaccines. Now that vaccines were becoming available, a lot of the media and, and discussions with employees, there was some questions with regards to the efficacy of and which vaccine would I get. And so we did, our team did a lot of research with regards to the Moderna and the Pfizer and looking at the efficacy rates and, and uh, the Oxford and the Johnson and Johnson, but really didn't matter in the end because no one was really had the opportunity to select. I'm sure many of you on this call have been vaccinated. Uh, I've been vaccinated and I happened to get the, uh, the Pfizer was the one that I that happened to be available. But if they had the Johnson and Johnson, that's the one that I would have gotten. And it's interesting how the media said, you know, was talking about efficacy and, and the typical lay person is going to look at that and say, oh my goodness, well, I don't want the Johnson and Johnson. It's only got an efficacy rate of 66%. Uh, 
But what the general public didn't realize is that efficacy rate, and many of you on this call are aware of that, it, it was basically measured the percent reduction in the mild moderate. It was still just as effective as the other vaccines for severe hospitalization and death. Um, and, and so to help kind of change the perception and, and find out how we could share this story and train our employees, because we really truly did want our employees to become vaccinated, because there's a lot of questions, do we really need to be vaccinated for COVID-19. And uh, it's estimated that 20% uh, of Americans are immune to this. I mean, at least this is some data from a few months back. So things can change as, as we've talked about before, but, uh, and you need approximately 80% uh, to get to herd immunity. And of course the new terminology is, you know, we're not really herds. And so I've heard that the change out there is we're changing from herd immunity to population immunity to sound better. Um, but uh, so basically 80 to 20% means that we need to get about 60% more uh, people vaccinated if we really wanna try to get to population immunity. Um, and the vaccine could definitely lower this. And I think there's a lot of skepticism and concerns and questions about the vaccines and how good they would be. And, um, and uh, we, we just really tried to educate our employees to say, yes, we desperately need vaccines to, to save our lives. And, and, and right now the data is showing that as well. If you look at the data, read the articles, um, it is showing where you're looking at where we still have uh, locations that are having rates of COVID-19 uh, or higher rates, most of those are with uh, people who have not received the vaccine. So then we had to decide, okay, are we gonna mandate this? Because we have essential workers, we have food that we need to, to get to keep, we have crops that we need to take care of. So are we gonna mandate this to our employees? So we, we went through that, you know, can we mandate it? And the answer is yes, but, the, but should we? And, and why would we? And, and really the main thought that we could think of is it's really to protect the health and safety of our own employees is, is why we would consider that um, so that we can create a safe work environment. Um, but then we, we realized that, well, job relatedness, uh, I think if we were in a hospital setting, that might be something we consider where employees we are known to be exposed to uh, uh, and other employees who have COVID-19. So we chose not to mandate. We chose to try to educate the best we could. We think that the CDC did a wonderful job at creating a PowerPoint, a pre-made PowerPoint for essential workers. We thought of creating our own, uh, but we thought it would be better for our workers to see that it came from the CDC and it wasn't just us, but we did kind of put our own little twist on it. We, you know, when we looked over this in English and Spanish and, and provided this training to help educate our employees on the importance of getting vaccinated, uh, there was nothing in there really trying to take away the fear from adverse reactions to the vaccine. So after about a month or so of the vaccines being out there, we had our statisticians take some of the data from the CDC that they were collecting uh, through, through their uh, data sites. And uh, we came up with this kind of a slide to try to show in the easiest way we could that, look, the, you know, if it's better to get the vaccine, yeah, there potentially could be a, a, an adverse reaction, but from the data that we had, it, it sure appeared that it'd be better to have a vaccine and have a reaction with that as opposed to uh, getting COVID-19 and the health effects and the unknowns about being hospitalized or not. And then now we're looking at uh, the long haulers as well that have side effects. And so we were really trying to do the best we could to educate our employees. And even with our best efforts of educating, we decided to track all of our employees. We, we did not require it, but we strongly encouraged through the education process to let their HR manager, and we actually gave an incentive to our employees. We we said, not only have we given you 80 hours of pandemic sick leave, but we'll give you an additional, you know, 16 hours of, of leave, uh, a day each for each day that you get your vaccine. And then if you needed additional, we'd even offer additional, just work with your HR professional if you actually had an adverse reaction and had to stay home uh, longer. So even with all that, in our different divisions of our operations, um, and this is just uh, domestically that we decided to keep this, not internationally, but these are all of our ones um, that were vaccinated. You can see that our downtown uh, operations were close to 50% today. Um, our row crops 
in, mostly up at, in Oregon and Washington, 36%. Our permanent plantings, which is mostly our, our nuts in California. And then you can see our cattle, which is kind of interesting. Our cattle division, which is spread from Canada to Florida, we're one of the largest cattle ranches in the world. And we have um, 100,000 cows out there that, uh, that, that we, we, we manage. And um, it's interesting, the mentality with regards to just that segment or that group. Uh, and, and, and that 9% may not necessarily mean that only 9% are vaccinated or choosing to get vaccinated. Some, some people's mentality is, hey, you know what? I don't think you need to know. I, you know, that's my own personal business that I got vaccinated and I'm not gonna let you know. So, um, but hopefully uh, with now that CDC is talking about, um, you know, allowing those who are fully vaccinated to not have to wear face coverings in the workplace, that's kind of a nice incentive. A lot of cowboys don't necessarily wanna wear face coverings or feel like they should. So, um, so do we follow as a company the CDC guidance? You know, what about the states? There, there are some state requirements. And, and then what about OSHA record keeping and contracting COVID-19 in the workplace? If we don't have a, a workforce that we feel is the population is, has reached immunity. Um, and so there's that question you have to ask as an employer, what do, what do you do to help continue to protect your employees? And so we decided as a company, a letter is actually going out this week to our employees uh, that we've made the decision that if you are fully vaccinated, uh, it will not be required that you wear face coverings. Now, California has a different rule. Of course, they'll have to follow. Or if there are some that are not vaccinated, then, then you still have to follow certain requirements. So uh, again, it'll be on a state-by-state -state basis. But as a company as a whole, uh, you know, that's the direction we've decided to go. And we're hoping that that's an incentive uh, to actually encourage our employees to get vaccinated or report to their HR representative that they have been vaccinated. So the future of agriculture and the summary kind of going over what I just went over, I, I, it's so important and it's wonderful that we have a pandemic policy and guidance ready to go for the next potential wave or, or whatever might come our way. We think it's, it's important to have adequate supplies of PPE, not hoarding, but making sure we have the right types and the amounts that will last us for a few months anyway, as we noticed that there was you know, uh, I think three months would potentially be adequate, but some people may uh, differ and, and want to have six months, but make sure we have adequate supplies. We will continue to uh, health screen employees and visitors and pre during pre-employment with questionnaires. Uh, we're going to continue to educate our employees and we have all the materials in place and continue to enforce the policies as we're still trying to get through this pandemic. Um, OSHA record keeping is now on our list, which we're not excited about, um, but it is potentially something that an employee can contract in the workplace. And it has impacted uh, our numbers or our lagging indicators. Uh, but I, I like that in that it's encouraging our management at each of the operations to uh, enforce um, our policies with regards to uh, the pandemic. I think it's so important to educate employees on, on vaccinations. Um, I know that there's different beliefs, there's all sorts of different mentalities out there, um, but it, it is important to, to look at the data, share the data, share the facts, and let employees make that choice. Uh, I think it's important to provide some incentives, whether it's not wearing face coverings or it's providing a, a sick leave day for them to get vaccinated. And then of course, uh, what I just shared with you that face coverings will be required or unless that you're fully vaccinated and that hopefully would be an incentive. So that's really kind of what we've learned and, and hopefully following these practices and these procedures, we will continue to help keep food on the table at uh, Chipotle and uh, Cheesecake Factory and some of your favorite fast food restaurants. We provide about 10% of the French fries to America. So um, anyway, that's all I have. Thank you for this opportunity. Great, thank you, Paul, for that uh, discussion on the impact of COVID on future operations. And I wanna thank all of our speakers uh, for your insightful presentations. And now we'd like to turn to the Q&A session of our webinar. We are a little short on time, but we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, the Q&A session will be moderated by Nicole. Nicole? Thanks, Sarah. We are a little short on time. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. We'll now begin the Q&A portion of today's webinar. 
And when submitting a question in the Q&A box, please provide the name of the presenter or presenters to whom the question should be asked. And please try to avoid the use of abbreviations or acronyms in your question. And we have a whole bunch. Let's see, the first one that came in was, uh, I think this is to everyone in general, with the increased focus in health in your organization, have you been making changes in employees' health insurance plans, such as increases in coverage of preventative services? Would anyone like to take that on? I can just speak um, from what we've seen. You know, uh, it's really a matter of if, if you if you have private health insurance, right? So an employer like us is in the market with. You know, we, it's not, we, we're not of a size where we've got like a, 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 a large plan. And so a lot of it has to do with what is available in the market. You know, what, what are Blue Cross or United or Aetna doing um, and what are they offering? But what I, what I will say is that you would have expected, right, with COVID, health insurance costs and everything to be going up. But what happened last year is there were so many medical procedures discretionary optional uh, visits, physicals that just got put off. So utilization and you know, your loss, your insurance, your insurance utilization seemed to be down. Um, and, and I think we're, you know, we're going to probably see that come storming back because everybody's going to want to get two years worth of medical work done in, um, in one year. But you know, it, it was a fairly low utilization year for us um, and, I, I, and the insurers are now anticipating that coming back uh, in, 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 a, in a big way. So really it's what's the health insurance market doing um, and what options are, are available. Um, uh, we've focused as much as we can on rainy day, on helping employees save for that emergency, emergency loans. I mean, we've been a lot more focused on what happens if, if something like this would occur and there's just not enough work for everybody because for a short period of time, a very short period, that was the case. Okay. Um, anything, anyone else want to respond to that? This is Barbara. Um, we didn't really add any preventive health benefits because we have a lot in place already. You know, the, the goal of our um, medical program is to prevent um, conditions. So we have a very, very strong preventive health benefit already. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is specifically for um, Barbara. You mentioned about adjustments to ventilation systems. Would it be possible to hear more details about that, particularly with regards to changes in fresh air ratio? Yeah, um, we have many, many different kinds of ventilation systems, so it's hard to give a single answer. We did try to increase outside air where we were able to. Sometimes, you know, if the humidity levels were too high outside, that didn't work very well. Um, but there are some really good references out there from the ACGIH, from AIHA, from ASHRAE. And, you know, we tried to follow the advice of what the, the leading experts were recommending. I can paste some of those um, links into the chat box if that would be helpful. I'm sure, yes. As a panelist, you can do that and share with all the attendees. Um, our next question is specifically for Brian. Did the trucking industry note labor shortages as a result of the pandemic? And has that changed since 2020? And what is the outlook moving forward? Um, our industry has had a chronic shortage of good drivers. Uh, the problem is that we're a cyclical industry. So in, in a trough, people conclude, oh, there's no shortage. Uh, and then we're, we're in a cyclical high, like we are now, people really see the shortage. Um, so what we saw in the first part of COVID, let's say March through May, June, um, it was a really a tale of haves and have nots. If you were hauling food, uh, toilet paper, consumer goods, last mile deliveries, you were busy. Um, 
if you were serving industrial clients that were shut down, um, you weren't so busy. So the industry sort of went through that phase and there was a lot of capacity on the market. Some of you remember there were drivers protesting at the Capitol. I'm, I'm not sure about what, but there was no work. Uh, there wasn't enough work. And the industry corrected itself. And, and you know, now the industry is back to being chronically understaffed. My concern is the number of people that during the trough left the industry, are they coming back? I mean, are we, are we able to get these people back in, as professional drivers? So, you know, we all need to earn a living, but professional drivers were completely whipsawed by this, right? I mean, a bust to a boom. And, and so, you know, there's some number of drivers, some percentage of drivers that just won't come back um, because of the, the COVID crisis. And that just compounds a, a, an existing issue, an existing problem. Nicole, let's try to take one more question and then we can just go to your last slide. Okay, so the next question in order of receipt is, do you believe that business interruption and commercial property insurance coverage apply to your business? There is a lot of controversy between commercial insurers and policyholders since there were no exclusions, yet there were business losses from interruptions or closures. What is the future for risk managers to cover all health and safety exposures? Gary, would you like to take a shot at that question? Sure. Um, you know, it's 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 very early. I know that we've worked very much on the side of instead of business interruption, we've had some opportunities. Uh, on the tax side from tax credits and things of that nature that we've been able to utilize. Um, we've closed a number of facilities and, and are going to try to uh, lease those out. And then, you know, using those tax credits, well, that's kind of what the landlords are telling us. There's an opportunity within some of the programs that are out there today to, to capitalize on that loss. Um, as far as on the risk management side and where that's going to go, uh, there is so many developing directions here and, and on the health insurance side to the points earlier for those organizations that don't have that in place. I agree with Brian. It's all kind of intertwined where there's going to be a lot of catch up. A lot of catch ups going to happen because a lot of things were put on hold. So all the way from health insurance all the way back, uh, I think we're going to see an increase in, in, in care for on the uh, on the, uh, on the counseling side, having people available for that, uh, really helping people with those things, recognizing those. I think we're gonna have to really circle back and, and think about that. You know, we talked about PSTD and some other things we, that we think may have occurred and some separation anxiety and the whole work versus home balance piece um, and those things. So all the way through from our landlords to our risk management, the way we look at these things, the way we look at insurance, Next uh, November, when the renewals come out, it's going to be a very interesting time for sure uh, on that side. Very, thank you, Nicole. If I could just jump in here quickly, I want to thank everybody. We've got some wonderful questions in the Q and A that we will not be able to get to today, and I want to commit to find a way to either bring everyone back for another panel and another at another time, or see if there's some way we can respond to you directly. Um, if we're able to copy the, uh, the Q&A. So I want to personally thank our uh, presenters. Um, this was a great discussion and I'll let Nicole uh, close this out. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind folks that we, um, we had a great discussion and some reminders. The um, link for an online evaluation of today's webinar is available in the chat box. Please take a moment to provide feedback on today's event, and we will use this feedback to improve our future webinar offerings. Please contact NIOSH, Office of Research Integration at ORI at cdc.gov about the availability of the webinar recording, slides, and unedited transcript. Lastly, Stay tuned for future communications about the 2021 Expanding Research Partnerships webinar series. Our next webinar on September 8th is titled The Future of Occupational Safety and Health in a Post-Pandemic World, the OSH Professional Association's Perspective. 
More information will be available on the NIOSH Office of Research Integration website. Thank you, everyone, and stay safe.